Thank you for joining me today. I'm standing on my father's farm in Southern Kentucky, rural Appalachia. Today, we're gonna to talk about moonshining in Southern Kentucky. In a few moments, I'm gonna be walking down this road and I'm gonna go through those hills, the forest that you see in the background. I walk for about an hour and a half through the woods and I will then emerge in an area of springs and caves that was a notorious moonshining area back in the day. In fact, I'm gonna take you to the exact spot where my great uncle was shot and killed in October, 1950 by the wife of his first cousin. My great uncle was a World War II veteran. He had a pension. He came back here after the war, engaged in moonshining, cockfighting, gambling. A few years prior to his death, just about a half a mile from here, he was engaged in drinking and gambling one night. A neighbor jumped him. My great uncle's young son, my second cousin, killed the man. And then my second cousin fled frantically through these woods down to my grandparents' house, which was just at the bottom of this hill, just this side of that clump of trees you see. He was saying that that family was after him, uh, scaring my grandmother to death. Fortunately, they were not chasing him and nothing ever came uh, of that killing uh, because he was such a, a young boy. But it did create hard feelings that were not healed until 1978 when my first cousin married a woman uh, from that family. Now, I know this country like the back of my hand, but it's been 40 years since I've done this trek uh, from here an hour and a half to the old moonshining area. And it's still gonna be on my father's farm. I'm bringing with me today my grandfather's long tom shotgun, 12 gauge, and a pistol. Now, I'm not doing that to be macho, not doing that to be cool, don't think there's any danger, but we are in Appalachia. There's still some moon shining, uh, there's some marijuana fields in the area, so you just want to be safe. Thank you for joining me, I'll see you on the other side. This was my path. At one point, I picked up an old overgrown roadbed, which in earlier times was the only way into my great uncle's and the shooter's property. This was my great grandfather, William Washington Carter's home, made of logs. Wash, as he was called, was an attorney shot in the Monroe County courtroom around 1924 while arguing a case before the judge, who happened to be his brother. The bullet remained lodged in Wash for life, rendering him barely able to walk, leaving him with a severe case of arthritis. Later in life, when he passed, his legs were so bowed by arthritis, the family had to saw in half tendons behind his knees to straighten his legs to place him in the wooden coffin. One of his sons, my great uncle who was shot and killed, lived here. On a chilly October evening in 1950, the wife of his first cousin came off their porch with a shotgun, firing at my great uncle who had been taunting the woman from a distance. My great uncle fled in this direction, down this hill, towards the wood line, towards his farm and home. When he reached the wood line onto his property, there was a small fence he had to cross. It was here, on this spot, in October 1950, that my great uncle was shot dead. He was running off of this hill, and the woman came off the front porch with a shotgun. As he raised his hand for her not to shoot, she shot him right through the armpit, killing him. He fell dead here. I am now trekking in search of the old spring that flowed naturally out of the ground, the site of his old moonshine still. Of course, there are no remnants of the still now. 
Although it's been 40 years since I've trekked this, my instincts are good. I come straight to the spring. Any sign of moon shining at this old location is long gone. Although I did find one plate that probably was a piece of it. Here is a cave complex nearby that is owned by my first cousin. Such terrain offered moonshiners water and cover and concealment. Called the Billy Miller Cave, used as a hideout for the notorious Rock Bridge Gang, a small band of outlaws that terrorized a five county area in southern Kentucky from 1880 until 1900, although none was ever charged with murder. One of my relatives, Elsie Carter, was described in a book on the gang as the gang's most daring and colorful member, a man of intelligence, a school teacher, politician, and outstanding orator. Once, the gang attempted to break into a local distillery by tunneling underneath the structure and, in the process, bored a hole in the bottom of a barrel of whiskey. The liquor started flowing freely and some of the guys took turns getting a drink. The roots of moonshining in Kentucky go back to the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, an uprising of farmers and distillers in western Pennsylvania in protest of a whiskey tax the federal government enacted. When President Washington sent in troops to quell the rebellion, many of the farmers and distillers fled to Kentucky, which began Kentucky's bourbon industry. Moonshining in Appalachia is part of the American lore, captivating the public who by the late 1800s had developed an enduring fascination and mystique with this backwoods man and his way of life. Moonshiner seemed to capture the spirit of America with his entrepreneurship and stubborn independence. Although a criminal, his sins were largely pardoned by an admiring public who sympathized with his duty to feed his family and make liquor. Driving high and wild. Here comes the Moonshine County Express. Three sisters inherit a hundred barrels of bootleg. He sure did make good shine. Honey, that ain't shine. That's real prohibition bootleg. Let's hear from some retired Southern Kentucky moonshiners and those Kentucky lawmen who chased them, the revenuers. Now some audio from joint interviews housed at the University of Kentucky's Louis B. Nunn Oral History Center. Russell Stockton, a former revenuer in Kentucky, and longtime moonshiner Wheeler Stinson. Both are now good friends. Interview terms heard are pot, where the alcoholic mash is converted to steam, the flake stand or condenser, and the worm, the long coil inside the condenser where the steam is converted to moonshine, thump keg, a clever design to distill the output a second time, increasing potency without having to run the distillate through the steel twice, Beer is the term used for mash, and pimp is an informer. Have you always lived in Wayne County, or are you a native? Yeah, yeah. Well, then you and Russ have always known each other then. Ever yes. how long he's been law, he's been acting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I started in the law profession in, in the early 50s when I came out of the service from uh, the Korean conflict. I served two terms in the uh, sheriff's office, back and forward from the Sheriff's Office to the Monticello Police Department. For the last 18 years, I've been an investigator for the Alcohol Beverage Control Board, State of Kentucky. Wheeler was one of the first names I probably heard when I was in the Sheriff's Office. I'll have to brag just a little bit on him. I've known him for approximately 34 years. He's always been a fellow that, uh, if he told you anything, you could uh, depend on it. His uh, Profession would be the only thing that uh, I didn't like about it. <laughs> Although he did have a uh, good name 
and a reputation of making uh, good moonshine whiskey. We have always got along. We have never had any, uh, I felt like that he has always done his thing and he felt like that I was trying to do my thing when I was running him through the mountains. I think maybe I have, uh, through, down through the years, I've tore him out two or three times. I was smoking one of those tailor maids and I think maybe he smelt that and <laughs> and that was all of it. And the last I saw of him, he was going up the opposite side of the hill. We have had our ups and downs down through the years. As he mentioned a while ago about uh, necessity, in the 30s and up through the 40s, the people in Wayne County or the shiners in Wayne County, they would make whiskey through necessity to <laughs> feed their families and not because uh, to do it or break the law in any way, but most of the country people had big uh, families and uh, they wasn't going to let them starve if there was any means of uh, providing for the family. I'd say that the mountain folks or the folks that have lived in the mountain and that has made moonshine, they pride themselves in their products. The art of making moonshine or making good moonshine, it is an art. I have tested some of uh, Wheeler's products down through the years. The last that I tested proofed out 102 to 104 proof. That's getting down with your better grades of whiskey. He's one of the sharpest shiners that I've ever come in uh, in contact with. If you're smoking, if you're wearing a, as the old revenues used to say, a pair of pinted toed shoes or left a track in any way or broke a limb that wasn't supposed to be broken. That was all a wheeler. He just wouldn't, he'd move his steel on you. He was pretty sharp in the mountains. You're a pretty good tracker then. An I, excellent tracker. <laughs> I've tracked him for miles and miles. He never did know it, but I don't plan on ever doing anything else, so I don't care. <laughs> but just like he said, if he broke one weed down or broke one wrong twig, it shouldn't have been broke. I know there's something going on, and I never quit till I tracked it down either. I just spent a week to run it down, and it wasn't about my stuff. Oh, I just would not take that kind of a chance. That's where you get caught so much. That's why I ain't been caught in more than I have in that many years. If I found some sign, I found where that sign come from and where it went. It might take me a week to do it, but I'd always do it. You'd be surprised how many barrels of beer that I've left sitting there. Number one, you want to know about how long that water's going to last. You get everything moved in there, and your water go dry, then you are hurting. So you've got to hunt somewhere else. You want to know that water and have it in a place out of the way where you know people don't have no business turning around. There's many pamphlets anymore. And you want to start with wooden barrels, that's what I always use. A lot of people use these metal barrels, I never would. So you've got to have a copper outfit, or should have, what we call the pot. That is the body of the steel, copper cap, we call the cap, and all the connections, thumper and all, if there's any way you can get it all copper, you want it. We learn fine water and dig him a hole and create a spring that I know of has the capability of doing. How do you do you, it? Well, a lot of times you can go and maybe just find a little, look like a muddy spot or something like that, or a lot of moisture or even a lot of water weed that grows in these hills, you know, and they don't grow unless water. Well, you just dam up a little uh, spring? Or... No, that wouldn't be enough. You would want to dig a, a, a basin deep enough to maybe hold two or three barrels Water. Oh, it wouldn't be a very big stream of water, and it might take, you know, maybe two or three weeks, or maybe longer than that, to ever seep enough out to ever get it full. But once you've got that hole full, and got your, what they call a flake stand, where your worm is, you've got it full, you see. Well, it didn't take that much. I know where ever seep in the mountain. I've, I've been in these mountains all of my life. There ain't a stream of water nowhere I don't know where it is. And a lot of my it, it rustling up did fine, I know. And it never will. Because <laughs> they wouldn't run maybe over six or eight foot from where they come out to go right back in the ground. And if you could get to a place like that, you know, why well, you pretty well had it made. And the most of this log would get down in the bed of a holler or something like that where there's a lot of water, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times they'd miss it that way. And I have found springs plumb up on these steep ridges. If you can ever find water up on these ridges, it won't never go dry. And that, really? That's fun. But you'd be surprised how much water is actually on these real steep ridges and stuff. But now it is hard to find. A lot of times you just got to get in this ivy, you know, and, and hunt for it.
Was there any particular kind of wood that you used that would create less smoke huh. than others? Yes, they are. The wood has a great deal in that, I'll tell you. Used to, way years ago, they was an awful lot called little dead chestnuts. You know, the chestnuts all died out in this country years ago. All these ridges were covered up with them little dead chestnuts, and people wouldn't burn nothing else at that back then but that, you know, because it was real flashy and with a flame, you know, and burnt good and, and good and dry and everything. But anymore, I always tried to pick dead dogwood, hard maple, or something like that, because it's got so much more heat to it than this chestnut would have. But this hardwood has got so much more heat, it won't take near as much wood. Ain't no smoke hardly to it. Once you've got your furnace hot, it'd be impossible unless you put wet wood in it. That's something I never do, to see any smoke from it until you just got right up to it, that's all. Then you really had to track Mr. Stenson to get him. You didn't see much of his smoke. No, no, there wasn't. Uh, as I said, he was pretty sharp. There's no uh, smoke whatsoever. You had to be uh, right on the operation before you saw any smoke. Well, you've been at it something like, say, 40, 43 years? I'd say anywhere from 43 to 45 years. I'm sure it, it supplements your income, doesn't it? Well, when money gets scarce and nothing to do, you don't have too much of a choice on to do something like, That's like right. that. That's why it, I always, you know, would get back into it. When I'd get out of work, like couldn't get a job or anything like mm -hmm. that, well, I'd get back into it because it's quick money and it's hard work. Now, don't let nobody kid you. It, their work there. How long would it take you to produce a, a batch of moonshine? In the summertime, I could have it ready in about four days, anywhere from three to four days, depending on how good your mall corn and how fast it took off working. That you was you one could do of it faster in the summer than you oh, could yeah, in the winter. Yeah, you can't hardly make out here in these hills now in the wintertime because uh, that beer has to stay warm if, if it works. <laughs> Over the years, how many different locations did you have? I wouldn't have the least <laughs> idea. <laughs> really, I wouldn't. Hundreds. Hundreds, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, you're right. How far would you go back into the woods or the mountains to, to set up your operation? Oh, anywhere from one to two miles, or maybe three, and, and I have one further than that. Mm -hmm. And carry every bit of it in there and out. On your back? That's right, on my back. No vehicle. That's something I never would do is to have my vehicle involved in, in any way. Absolutely. Because I know that they called it, they could take it, and that's why I never would have my vehicle involved in it. No way to know how. But I've carried it from here, and well, Russell knows where it is, what they call the Helms Creek in Young. I've carried it plumbing that country and carry my stuff back here. That's a long way. That's a long ways. How far? Five miles, wouldn't it? Yeah. What sort of conveyance would you rig up to carry it back out with? Burlap sacks. How many sacks could you carry out at a time? Well, we'd use to put three gallons of the sack. We'd use to bring six gallons. Sack on each shoulder. Yeah, we'd tie them together, see, and just sling one behind and one in front. Uh-huh. Cars and girls. Hot pants and no guts. Good old J.B. Johnson. High-powered cars and hundred-proof women. Ready? All hell breaks loose. Run and shine across the county line. <laughs> Climb on board the Moonshine County Express for the ride of your life. Where, Mr. Stenson, did most of your whiskey stay in Wayne County? Or did it go over the state line? Tell you the truth, I've had it to go everywhere, just about. <laughs> well, I've had in, in about every state. I, I've I've had my whiskey go there. Because people come in this country, they left this country, they'd hear about me, they'd come here, or get somebody to come here with them. Yet I know, you see, in order to get it, because I wouldn't let them have it no way in the world if they didn't know them. I had a woman to come in here one time and visit these hippies. She was uh, something in Africa, and she wanted to find to take back over there. And uh, she come down here, and I let her have it, because I got pretty well acquainted with her, you know, mm -hmm. while she's in here, and she took it back over there. But I've had to go to Germany, and God knows where, <laughs> where all. But a lot of it uh, had went, you know, to Wisconsin, 
Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, you name it, and it's just about went there and just tell you the truth. California, there's a guy used to every time he come in, he come in once a year, he'd come to me and if I didn't have it, I'd usually know somebody that did, you know, and he would not buy it unless I went with him. And I'd take him to Tennessee or somewhere like that, you know, and get it. But he'd always take him a little back. Over the years, you've had a reputation for making excellent whiskey. Well, yeah, I have. There's so many people. They make it on everything in the world in Tennessee and everywhere in the world. And there's a lot of people right here in Wayne County that absolutely wouldn't touch it nowhere in the world if they know it'd come from Tennessee. Is that right? That's right. Absolutely. They are many more. Well, I've had different and different ones come here, and I'd tell them they'd have to go on across the line. I wouldn't have to give it to them. And they'd turn around and go back to it because they just won't drink it. They've got a name over there, and they're putting out bad stuff, and that's, that's the reason they won't go. But I ain't never had nobody to bring whiskey back on me, never. Now, I've never had nobody to come back and tell me I couldn't drink that stuff I got off of. I ain't never had that to happen. A lot of them, like, they'd come here and buy it in Tennessee. See, they, they'd open it up after they get a hold of it. A lot of them do that. I've told them many one, you be sure that you leave that stuff exactly like you get it. I've got a good reputation of putting out good stuff, and I want to keep it. We're now going to listen to these guys tell how they would shake a bottle of shine to be able to tell the proof of the shine. They did not use any fancy instruments back in the day. They would simply shake it and based upon the bead, which they will explain, they were able to tell the proof of it. And the bead, well, they can explain it better than I, is when you shake it and it's the little bubbles that come up. Now, this is rather old shine. My cousin made it several years ago. I don't know what the proof is on this. He stopped making it because he was convicted of stealing a mattress and placed on probation. I have placed a towel under this shine because my great-grandfather, William Washington Carter, the attorney who was shot, he drank shine. He actually needed it as medicine after he was shot. He had placed some on his wife's brand new sewing machine and it took the varnish off the sewing machine and she was highly upset. And I don't want my mama to get upset if I take the varnish off of her piece of furniture here. When you made, how did you proof your whiskey? Did you proof it by taste or by bead? Bead. Oh, by bead. Yeah. On the average, with a good barrel of mash, what would your whiskey usually proof? Just on the average. It kind of depends on how much you run out of it. Say, for instance, you run five gallons of good stuff above a bead, above a whiskey bead is what I'm talking yeah. about. You, know. you can say that you can put around two gallons of water in that, but in during this mixing now, it will evaporate. You will lose some, because it, it will evaporate out of there and get away from it before you can get it fixed down, you know, and canned up. I can pretty well tell just about what it is, you know, by the way it's beating it in the container that I'm mixing in. Mm -hmm. But I always use a half a gallon can, you know, to stir it, and a lot of times it takes a right smart little bit to mix this alcohol and water. Because I have poured it in there and it looked just exactly like grease. It wouldn't mix, you see, that alcohol and water won't mix for a certain period of time, and it might be a minute, two minutes, or something like that before you, it'll ever even start beating. If you run five gallons of good stuff, beating stuff we call it, that's above a whiskey bead. Mm -hmm. Why, it ain't no problem to put two gallon of water in it. I can pretty well tell just about what it is, you know, by the way it's beading it in the container that I'm mixing in. For the ones that are not familiar with the bead, a bead is a bubble that mm -hmm. is on the surface of the liquid. If the whiskey is too high, the bead will be way up. If it's too low, it will be an under. Of course, Wheeler can look at a bead and tell more about it than chemists could in a big laboratory, I'd say. Then you knew what your proof was before he ever tested it. Something near it, yes. The way I always fixed it, he minds in there if it's too high. Why, he'll have great big bubbles on there. And they won't stay there very long. They'll disappear. And if it's too low, he'll be more white, sudsy looking. And uh, real fine. Like, if it's a good whiskey bead, now it will not beat under 100 proof. You might as well figure on that. You go buy some, some of this whiskey and shake it. See, that's the way you tell how big your beads and stuff like that. You've, you've got to shake it. And I'd almost say that I'll give you a $20 bill if it'll hold a bead up there under 100 proof. Government whiskey or any other whiskey. I don't care where it comes from.
the way I always want to get it. Now, a lot of times, they're different than the bead on whiskey. It's in, in, in the water you make it with, the water you use to temper it with. And a lot of times, you can get more water in it with certain kinds of water than you will others. And the way I always try to get it, I always use a half a gallon fruit jar, and I might get a pint or something in there, and you can take and slap your hand over there, there's no lid on there, and shake it three times real hard, and just turn it up and, and just watch it. And that bead just stand all over there, directly hit a break in a figure eight. It'd be a big one, a little one. And when you get it like that, I'd say it'll run anywhere from 100 to 105 proof. Them bubbles, when it's more than 100 proof, and it gets up around 105 proof, if you look at them real close, it looks like they're kind of green looking. Got a green shade to them. But if it's under that, it'll be more foamy white, real white looking. See, that goes back to what we was talking about a while ago. There's art to making moonshine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, from the eyes of cops. Oh, how the moon shines on the moonshine so merrily. How often would you have to move your still? Well, I wouldn't move it unless somebody found it or somebody got close to it. I figured if they had found it or would find it, I'd move it out. And most of the time, well, I'd pour my stuff out, leave my best little land there, and watch them, maybe for a month or two, and never touch a thing. If anybody went around, they'd use a roll of barrel or something or other to give it away, you know. And if they wouldn't, well, I'd eventually go in and move them out, but I never would put it back up in the place no more. What would you often find is empty? Operation? Yes, I found through this area here, there's a lot of old steel sites that have been used, and for some apparent reason, they have moved to a new location. Wheeler, he is a woods person. I've heard people say that he knew squirrels by name. If you started to track him, you would have a very difficult job. Making of moonshine, although I don't approve of it, is a art within itself. Years ago, it was almost a necessity for the making of moonshine whiskey. It was used for various reasons. Our old folks used it for medicine. They would mix camphor with the moonshine whiskey for various things, stomach aches, headaches, you name it. Also, they would put various herbs and roots in moonshine whiskey to create a medicine. They used it for various things, rheumatism, arthritis, headaches, bunions, ingrowing toenails, and everything. Communication for the moonshiners in the remote areas of the county. Up this long holler, there were several stills. At the end of the holler, there was a family that had a large anvil. Each anvil has a little different sound when you strike it with a hammer. If there was any law officials, revenuers, they would strike this the anvil with a hammer, and that would let the folks on up the holler know that there was somebody a coming or strangers a coming, and they would all get away from their steel, cover it back up, and get about their farm work or whatever they was doing. After you heard that anvil ring or that bell ring, you might as well turn around and go back because you wouldn't find nobody at no steel. The thing that we used to use in this country was a gun. How many shots? Three. Three shots. Three shots. There has been, and I guess there will be, a great demand for uh, moonshine whiskey, more so in the cities at this time than there was maybe years ago. In the city now, it's a novelty. Everybody wants to show their friends that they have got a gallon of moonshine whiskey, and it came from a certain, certain location. Maybe if they are from Kentucky and live in the city, they want that to be show their friends and acquaintance that this is pure Kentucky corn whiskey. Now, there's very, very little corn whiskey ever made. The process is too long. It takes too much corn to make a gallon of whiskey. They make it now by using ball corn, which is a very small amount of corn that is sprouted, and cornmeal and sugar. That's about the main ingredients for the mash to go into making the moonshine whiskey. Now, the farther east you get, they use more rye 
than they do around in this locale here. Rye mash, you don't have to be as particular with it on when you make. You can let it go a little while longer or you can make it a little bit earlier than uh, you could made, it, made out of meal and sugar. The making of moonshine whiskey is a hard job. You have your barrels to carry into the woods. You've got to find water, the first thing. Then carry your, all your equipment in there. When you drag them through the underbrush in the woods to the still location, that is a great chore. After you get all that there, you have to build your furnace. It is a rock, mud, round shape, about a couple of feet high with the opening in the top and an opening in the back for the smoke to go out. You place your steel or pot in that and then you daub around it or paste around it with mud to keep the heat down below your furnace top. Then you have a cap that sits on that with crossover arms that goes to your thump keg. From your thump keg you have some more pipes that goes into your cooling system which is called a worm that is coiled around and around that goes into a barrel. barrel is filled with water. If you have ample supply of water, you'll have a hose running from your spring or stream that will be a running a steady stream and not let this cooling water get hot. The better you keep that cool, the better that your supply of whiskey will be when it runs out the end. I was walking through these woods 50 years ago when I spotted this jug buried in the ground. Only the spout was visible. I dug it up and just by looking at it, assumed it had to do with moonshining given this was a notorious moonshining area. After unearthing, I shook the jug, only to hear the sounds of rocks or hard dirt clogs inside the jug, except it wasn't rock or dirt clogs. Can you see what it is? They are as well preserved today as they were 50 years ago. Inside are four crystallized mice. One is half eaten. You can even still see their whiskers. This confirmed, in my mind, this was a moonshine jug, as I assumed the mice entered the jug only to die a drunken death, and the alcohol preserved them. 100 years later, they are making their YouTube debut. A documentary film crew from Germany came into the mountains of southern Kentucky and made a documentary on moonshining and it featured among others revenueer Jack C. Miller and moonshiner Tommy Strunk. I have been unable to locate the documentary but if you find it please post in the comment below. Here the revenueer and moonshiner talk about it. Back a few years ago well I was a happy to do a story and a movie for Germany and got the okay to help make a movie on moonshine. And as usual, Tommy was wanted, I wanted uh, in on it. And I brought uh, the lady from Germany down and she talked to him kind of like we are today. And they show in that movie over in Germany now, it's an educational program. It'll never be showed in the United States. So Tommy, he's a movie star in Germany. <laughs> they forgot to send him a check to me though. Did they forget? <laughs> Mine too, Tom. <laughs> There are many interesting stories I did not include in this video in the interest of time, such as tricks moonshiners use to see if anyone has been near their still, like placing a coin on the ground, which an interloper would surely pick up, or running a black piece of thread across a path, to stories of moonshine stills blowing up and the warning signs that it was going to blow, such as the cap starting to puke, as the moonshiners say and the price of moonshine, their favorite recipes, corn liquor versus sugar liquor, and so on. What follows are links to these interviews. Thank you for watching and please check out my other videos.